Hey there, John McWhorter. Glenn Lowry. Welcome to The Glenn Show, John. I'm really glad to be talking to you. Thanks for having me back. Not at all, man. You're a mainstay. In Please. fact, you're hard to get, John. Why do you play hard to get like that? Man? No, it's not hard to get. It's you know, <laughs> this, this is the first time in ten years I've been teaching two courses a semester, and I am finding that I'm a little out of practice in juggling that plus everything else. So I'm getting a little absent-minded. I'm <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> Looks like you have to work for a living. Uh, yeah, for a change. How come huh? I actually have to have to have to work to eat? But that's what's going on lately. So I have joined. I have joined the real world once again. Well, my scheduling assistant, who happens to be me, mm -hmm. tells, tells me that it takes three or four calls to, to get you hooked up for uh, one of these conversations. Well, for the, for this one in particular, and I, I apologize for that. No, that's all right. You're, you're worth getting. You're worth, worth you working are. hard to get, uh, get you up. So, um, we're the black guys at bloggingheads.tv, and it falls to us to talk about the role of race in this uh, campaign, uh, mm -hmm. if any. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's going to be one of our topics today, along with breaking news, breaking news. Mitt Romney overheard uh, speaking earlier in the year to uh, at a fundraiser uh, for his campaign and writing off 47% of the electorate as not being worth his time to solicit their votes or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, so we'll talk about that. And uh, I don't think we can get away without at least... Uh, saying a few words about what's going on um, over in um, North Africa and in mm -hmm. the Middle East and throughout the Islamic world, uh, protests uh, against um, an offensive uh, video that's been released and uh, demonstrations against the United States that have um, resulted in the death of our ambassador in Libya and other things. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. Okay. That's our agenda. That's right. How are you doing, by the way? How, how's life? Uh, the, how's the baby? The uh, baby is is very good. She's um she's adorable as always, and she very much recognizes her two parents, which is very gratifying. And at Columbia, I'm doing the Western Civ Core curriculum and an introduction to linguistics at the same time, so I'm shifting gears wildly and enjoying it. I really I had forgotten how much fun it is to have this much structured schedule. You know, I'm pretty good at cranking stuff out on my own. All of a sudden now I have to be somewhere at somebody else's behest all the time. I kind of like it. How are you? I guess I'm getting by, John. I'm, you know, I'm sort of limping along. I'm, I'm not going to uh, give you a sad song here. I'm doing okay. I can't really complain. Classes have started and it is good to be busy and embedded again in this flow of activity. Embedded, that's right. Uh, you know, th that does feel pretty good. Uh, I had a terrific summer, I must say. Traveled to South Korea, as you know. Traveled to South Asia, mm -hmm. as you know. And uh, had a family reunion where my, um, my five children and, uh, well, four of my five children and five of my six grandchildren gathered uh, for a week uh, last month in the Pocono Mountains of Pennsylvania to commiserate the Lowry family reunion. Man, I'm a patriarch. <laughs> <You know? laughs> well, that must feel weird. It does feel absolutely weird, but it was such a delight uh, to have my son Alden, who's a journalist in Chicago, and his three children and his wife, and my daughter Lisa and her two boys. Uh, they, they live in suburban D.C. Uh, and uh, my two sons, Glenn and Nehemiah, um, unfortunately, their mother passed away last year, and, you know, in a way we were honoring and remembering her by coming together. It was just wonderful to be surrounded by my children and grandchildren, and we just had a great, great time. I have tons of photos, John. Go to my oh. Facebook page, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, so, so I'm feeling, you know, I'm feeling okay, I guess. Thanks for asking. Mm -hmm. um, That's but, good. Uh, Let's get on with the business at hand. So now, you must have seen Ta-Nehisi Coates' long essay published in the current issue of the Atlantic Monthly. I did. Under the title, Fear of a Black President. Yeah. And one thing that race guys like you and I have to do is periodically assess, you know, the racial temper of national politics and this and that. What did you think about... Uh, Tanya Hesey Coates' piece, and what more generally is your your uh, thinking these days about uh, the role, if any, of race, racial resentment, racial loyalty, 
whatever it might be, uh, racial stigma, stereotyping, whatever, race card playing, strategic mm -hmm. uses of race, race signaling to the electorate, you know, dog whistle use. What's, uh, not to put words in your mouth, what's, what's your <laughs> thought about that? <laughs> you know what I think about that? I think that um, the general orthodoxy about it among what you might call right-thinking people neglects the issue of degree. And so the issue is, is Obama received to some extent based on his race? Yes, of course. But I think that Ta-Nehisi's article and its implication that Obama's race has been a major aspect of his reception in the story of the last four years, I think it's inaccurate. And it's interesting because I actually, I ducked something, which I usually don't. You know, if there's one thing that I seem to be kind of known for, it's, it's enjoying controversy, and I suppose I do. But I was asked to be on MSNBC's Chris Hayes, Up With Chris Hayes show, which I do pretty regularly. I with, thought you said you'd do Chris Hayes whenever he called. Except this time. It was okay. with ta and with Melissa Harris-Perry. And I thought about it, and I decided I know what one is supposed to think on that particular show about this particular issue with that particular article out in the Atlantic right now. And I just thought... I don't feel comfortable putting myself on a stage for two hours with ta Coates, with whom I've had my differences, and with Melissa, who, you know, she's very cordial with me, but she thinks of me as, you know, a certain something. And I just thought, I can't, <laughs> I just, I decided I can't take the risk of being perceived that negatively for two straight hours. Well, with... well hold on, John. Uh, okay, I hear you. you. You didn't want to do the show, and you stated your reasons, but I just got to tell you this. Melissa Harris Perry thinks everybody is a certain something. She thinks Cornell West is a certain something. That's true. She, she thinks Orlando Patterson is a certain something. She thinks Glenn Lowry is a certain something. And excuse me, but I'm entertaining the hypothesis that all black males who are not married to her in <laughs> Melissa Harris Perry's mind are a little certain something that need to be told <laughs> off. Okay? She's in the telling black men off business. Okay, there, I've said it. Go ahead, <laughs> Melissa. Have at me. <laughs> yeah. Well, she's she's a controversialist her, herself, and I know that she's had problems with with quite a few people. I don't know. I don't know what you mean. I don't know her as somebody who is anti male in particular. Maybe if I knew more about I, her, I'd see okay. it. I see her as having had some problems with Cornell West because of what happened with Princeton. And I don't know how she feels about Orlando Patterson. I imagine his, his quote-unquote conservative strain would alienate her. And I know that that's how she feels about some of my statements along those lines. She's never attacked me. But I just felt that on that stage, I'm taking the risk of being made a fool of because I thought no matter what I say, I'm going to be seen as just an apostate rather than just feeling that as history will be written about the Obama experience so far. I just don't think that his race has played a significant part. Would you agree? No, but I would not agree with Harris Perry, uh, and I don't think I agree altogether uh, with Coates. Mm -hmm. um, I think his race is playing a big part, but not in the way that they say. Okay? Mm -hmm. They say racist America, they won't give him a chance. Everybody is uh, hemming him in and uh, tying him down because of race and, you know, um, whatever, and, and I'm, I, I think I share your view that we ought to be slow, not quick, to uh, interpret events in that way, in that classical patterns of sort of white racist uh, denigration or uh, withdrawal of cooperation from African Americans are not operative here. Mm -hmm. on, the other, on the other hand, on the other hand, I think there's a subtext, I think it's a little bit more subtle, I think there's a kind of um, um, subliminal thing that's going on mm -hmm. uh, with race that um, that does affect him in uh, in uh, interesting ways. Okay, so for example, so for example, he did not go and speak to the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People this summer. Mm -hmm. It's not an attack on Obama. He didn't go. All right, he says or they say scheduling difficulties. I say malarkey. Mm -hmm. I say optics difficulties. Mm -hmm. Optics difficulties are a crowd of cheering left liberal black people embracing their black president is exactly what Mr. Obama does not want. Mm -hmm. The swing voters of Ohio, uh, Florida, North Carolina, uh, etc. Certainly. See. Okay. So this is a way in which um, race is affecting him, although not as I say, 
a kind of straightforward repeat of the 1950s, no blacks need apply racism, something that's a little bit more subtle than that. Mm -hmm. um, um, neither he nor the Republican candidate are willing to talk, and we're going to say something more about the Republican candidate in a moment, are willing to talk at all about poverty. You've got Cornell West and uh, Tavis Smiley now touring the country on their poverty tour, trying to raise the profile of the issue. And I just looked at the numbers recently. Man, the poverty numbers are going up and up and up. This is a serious long-term recession. Serious. Mm -hmm. Serious long-term recession that has wreaked havoc in the b b bottom 20% of the population. Now, the president, a Democrat, a liberal Democrat, mm -hmm. is saying very little about that. Mm -hmm. It's all about the middle class, mm -hmm. and and that would probably be the case no matter who. I was going to say John Edwards would be the same way right now. Yeah, uh, but but what I'm saying is I think Obama has less wiggle room. I mean I think he really has to worry about being labeled the food stamp president. He mm -hmm. really has to worry he does. about it seeming that he's advocating for the people who are dependent upon government, not for the people who are the job creators and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And I think it's more so for him because he's black. This is just me thinking that those kind of attacks, which could be leveled at any Democrat, have a greater chance of sticking on this Democrat because he's black. So, I mean, I just think race is in the mix here, definitely in the mix. Certainly in that uh, and, I, and I should say, by the way, that uh, the Obama uh, camp are not above uh, exploiting sort of subliminal racial aspects of our political culture to their own advantage by, you know, suggesting sometimes not so subtly that uh, one or another criticism or attack on them is motivated by some kind of invidious racial Michelle motive. Obama so that's, has struck that note, right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I think... Um, so that's what I'm thinking. And I think one thing that has to be said is that to feel... Yes, yeah, certainly race plays a role, but if we're more specific, has Obama's presidency been hobbled or significantly colored by white people's biases, subliminal or overt, against black people? I think that in terms of what the history books will say, the answer yeah. is not what a ta Coast, to use him as a generic concept, would say. So, for example, we can all know, I remember the moment, and I'm sure you remember it too, when Obama is trying to make his first, um, his first significant speech as president, and Republican Joe Wilson, white from South Carolina, yeah. yells out, you lie. I remember the moment. And I remember turning to my wife and saying, who in the world just yelled that out? Now, was that informed somewhat by race? We can't put electrodes on his head. But I say yes. Yeah. I highly doubt that if John Edwards had been making that speech, Joe Wilson would have yelled, you lie. I feel it in my guts as an American black person of these times. Yeah. But the but issue, you know? but the issue one, one more thing, Glenn. The issue, yeah. though, is degree. Does Joe Wilson and little things like that signify that Obama has been stubbing his toe on racism everywhere he goes? And I say there's no evidence for that. Yeah, okay, degree. And, and then it gets subjective and it's very hard to draw a line. Um, but let me ask you this. So one of uh, Coates's points, one mm -hmm. of the anecdotes that he uses to drive uh, the narrative of his essay uh, has to do with the statement that Obama made after the Trayvon Martin uh, killing mm -hmm. uh, created a national furor. Mm -hmm. And the president, in some context, addressed himself to the matter, saying, and I believe this is a quote, if I had a son, he would look like Trayvon. Right. Okay? And what he did then was to personalize something that had been a kind of, you know, uh, political and uh, maybe to some degree policy matter, uh, and, and to racialize it implicitly, he called attention to his own blackness mm -hmm. from uh, the powerful office of chief executive uh, and sort of presiding officer of the American executive government. Mm -hmm. and, and he said, you know, the guy looks like me, basically, and I'm, you know, therefore, you know, especially sensitive, aware of, mm -hmm. you know, attuned to the concerns that people have raised in this regard. And a ton of bricks fell on him from the right. Mm -hmm for having said that. You see the president's a racist. You see the president's playing a race card. You mm -hmm. see the president favors black people. And what Colt said, and I do think this is true, is that, you know, we elect people and they occupy these offices and they do the job, but they're, they're not just uh, functionaries. They're also embodiments of us and of sure. us and all of our diversity. Okay? Mm -hmm. 
So if there's a southerner up there speaking with a twang in his voice, that means something to people who speak like that. Uh, and if there's somebody from my religious group who is ascending to the highest office, whether it be a Mormon or one day it will be a Jew who occupies that office, that will mean something. That will resonate. And when the person conducts the office and carries out the ceremonial function, when the first family assembles for an Easter egg hunt on the White House lawn, when they solemnly preside over the returning of uh, the uh, uh, remains of, uh, of American military people who have died in the line of duty and so on, <clears throat> in their person, they embody something, they inflect something, they connote and convey something subtly uh, about the nature of the country. And Colt's point is, many people are not comfortable with an African American who has a little bit of a swagger, who is hip, um, who is black, okay? mm -hmm. carrying out the grand functions of American government, and at the same time bringing into those functions mm -hmm. kind of the, the 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 tone, the kind of style, the the, the you know cultural resonance mm -hmm. resonating with uh, this element of America. And I have to tell you, John, I think there's something to that, man. I mean, I watched yeah. the South Side of Chicago become a caricature in uh, the 2008 campaign because of Jeremiah Wright and all this other stuff, <coughs> uh, from which it has never recovered. We now have a president of the United States who is from the South Side of Chicago, but you wouldn't know it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I'm, you, do, do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. He's a Chicago... And, uh, the, the, the narrative is he's a Chicago politician. You know, he's got more in common with uh, uh, Richard Daly's or the Rahm Emanuel's than he does with the uh, one million plus African Americans who live uh, south of Madison Avenue uh, in, in Chicago, Illinois, which constitutes a world. And it's a world from which uh, Barack Obama has arisen, uh, which to a certain degree he embodies. His wife was born and bred in that world. And it's been denutered. It's you know it's been neutered, denatured, uh, stripped of, of all of its uh, specificity because America's not ready to hear that aspect of its own voice. Something like that. I'm sorry if I sound like Melissa, but no. you know. No, I think that's my um, thought. for one thing, I think we have to qualify what we mean by America because I think that's not true of America. That's true of some people and people with rather loud voices. And more to the point, yeah. There are some people who are uncomfortable with a bit of swagger in the White House, with the idea that a black person is going to be the one in charge and telling them what to do. Sure, I don't think that surprises anybody. We knew that from the beginning. But the proper response to that, given the grander nature of things, I think is, descriptively, that's true. Fox News is not going away. Bigoted white people aren't going away. But the issue is degree. Ultimately. In the grand scheme of things, and I don't mean to be dismissive, Glenn, but I really do think that the, following, that right, the following two words are the answer. Who cares? I mean, sure, you can go document the things that people are going to say in columns, especially on the Internet at this point. So if Obama says something sympathetic and identifying with about Trayvon Martin, yes, yeah, a certain kind of person is going to say, there he goes with the race stuff again. But really, who cares? And this is why we know. I that, care, John. But wait, wait, wait Glenn. This is oh, why sorry. I'm saying who cares. Look at the fact that he's about to be reelected, and I feel safe enough, especially today, in saying that that's what's going to happen. All these uh, things we have been said. That, John. No, I, he's going to be all, and I, you know, I'll eat my words if he isn't. But all of those things have been said, and yet here we are, and the man is actually almost certainly going to have another four years. Which is to say that, yeah, life isn't fair. Life is going to knock you around. But has it gotten him out of office? Has it kicked him out of office? And if it hasn't, then I'm more interested in the more general story of his rather mediocre presidency and how he might be able to improve it as we go on. I just see the whole racial aspect of it, to obsess over it and to call it the fear of a black presidency, although Coates maybe did not give it that title. It's applying an 80s, 70s lens to a much more complicated modern reality. Okay, John, I got your message. I see where you're coming from. I don't agree. Uh, who cares? So I care. Um, the president... Um, when has he mentioned, <laughs> I don't know how this is going to sound, when has he mentioned slavery? Okay, when has the president doesn't. talked about slavery? Uh, I guess there's not a lot to say, is there? <coughs> um, anyway, never mind, forget it. I'm sorry I even mentioned it. No, okay, let's move on to the next it's topic. important. It's, very, it's a very important discussion to have. 
And I'm just okay. Here, let me put it like this: You have a Passover seder at the White House. Mm -hmm. and that's all about slavery, this enslavement by the Egyptians of the Jews, the deliverance of the historic Jewish people from uh, bondage, and so forth and so on. Okay, but. The black president of the United States cannot address the legacy of slavery in the United States of America mm -hmm. that cast a shadow all the way into the 21st century. Mm -hmm. Would you be satisfied if he did it in the next four years? Um, yep, that would help. Because maybe he wasn't going to do that when it would have possibly put his being real. <laughs> Although I don't think it would have, to be honest. I think some people would have said some things and largely... I don't even know what I'm talking about, man. I, I, I would draw, I think I'm probably over the top here. Uh, let's move on to safer ground. Um, <laughs> the next topic, which was um, Mitt Romney thinking that 47% of the electorate, or maybe it's 46%, according to Timothy Noah this morning, don't pay federal income taxes, mm -hmm. they get benefits from the government, they are dependent on the government, they are not uh, exhibiting initiative, I'm not quoting, I'm paraphrasing, mm -hmm. uh, they're not going to vote for a Republican candidate who wants to cut taxes because they have no benefit from getting their taxes cut after all, they're not paying any. Mm -hmm. um, he's got those people, I'm not worried about them, uh, says candidate Romney. He says it's uh, not his I'm, job to worry about them, right. It's not my job to worry about them, I'm going to try to get these swing voters in the middle, who should be disappointed with the president's, and you called it mediocre. Isn't that what you just got to say? Which, which mediocre? <coughs> I thought you said that uh, President Obama's uh, performance in the first... Oh, yes, yes, yes. Didn't yes. you just say that? So, candidate Romney is saying, I'm going to try to use that fact to woo uh, voters in the middle, but I'm not going to get these 47% or whatever it is who are uh, dependent on, uh, on the uh, uh, public uh, fisc for, yeah. their, for their sustenance. Now, um... A ton of bricks has fallen on candidate Glenn, Romney for having. What was that said word that. you just used? Public what? Fisk. F I S C. I never As knew in, that was a word. Go ahead. That's a word, man. Check it out. Oh, well, Fisk I learned a word today. Okay, go ahead. Because the noun. You learned that in Econ 101, John. I guess you didn't take that, huh? I actually didn't. Fisk. Okay, <laughs> okay I'm going to keep that. Take economics, my man. <laughs> I read about it. <laughs> anyway, what do you think about the flap over Romney's uh, right. uh, purported gaffe? Yeah. What do you think? Um, okay. Look, I'm not going to vote for Mitt Romney. I want you and everybody listening to know that. I'm going to vote for Barack Hussein Obama. Okay? Mm -hmm. um, I think as I watch this campaign that Romney um, is deeply hampered by the fact that the press <coughs> are hostile, by and large, and looking uh, for an excuse to foster a narrative that says uh, Romney's a loser, uh, Romney is unfit, Romney is this caricature of a person, this, that, and the other. Uh, I think when I compare the coverage that I've seen so far in this uh, sort of 36-hour window, um, to the way in which uh, Obama's uh, famous comment during the 2008 campaign about the white working class uh, voters in places like Pennsylvania who wouldn't vote for him because they were clinging to their guns and their religion and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I'm struck by the sort of universal condemnation uh, and uh, lack of any kind of qualifying uh, tone uh, in the coverage of this on uh, Romney, who's being pilloried left, right, and center mm -hmm. for uh, both running an incompetent campaign and for the substance of what he had said. Mm -hmm. And f I don't think it was that bad is what I'm saying, okay? I am not agreeing with the comment. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying I think that the negative reception of it is overblown and is, in my mind, an indication of the subtle uh, bias against his candidacy that inhabits the people who have their... Uh, hands on the levers of public communication in the country. On the mm -hmm. substance of it, I think it's true that the um, uh, political implications of the, of the um, uh, growth of the welfare state is to build in a certain momentum on behalf of the uh, party that brands itself as defenders of the welfare state. And I believe that it's true that there are, over the long term, uh, definite uh, tendency for this kind of reinforcing 
political dynamic to work, which is you legislate benefits, the set of people who get those benefits become loyal to the party that has produced those benefits, and that enhances the political uh, leverage of that party. I don't think there's any, if, if uh, defense contractors or um, venture capitalists or um, uh, small business people uh, who might be inclined to go Republican do so in part because they understand the philosophy of that party to reinforce and amplify their own personal interests, then the same thing is going to be true at the other end of the ideological spectrum. Um, so <coughs> I think there's some merit in that. Um, I think as a matter of political strategy, however, um, he was speaking to fundraiser, to a loyalist, just as Obama had been in 2008, didn't think that what he was saying there was going to be publicly broadcast, wouldn't have said it that way uh, if he had known. But of course, in this era of the uh, smartphone and all of that, everybody has to assume everything that they say everywhere is going to be known. And I think as a matter of political strategy, a statement like that is definitely very harmful uh, to him. So that's what I think. <clears throat> I don't do know. Think? I think, as of this one, I can't even pretend to consider him what's called a a serious man, and I think that it's a tragic symptom of the Republican Party establishment, such as it is, that the best person they could come up with, with even a semblance of the gravitas to become the actual candidate, would be someone of this timber who would say during what many economists, and you would know better than me, but many economists would call a depression, during a depression would call people, many of whom are those who have been put out of work by this depression and are having a really hard time, people who are sucking on the public, I'll use the word this time myself, fisk. You're talking about this 47 and 46 percent. Couldn't he have given a little thought beforehand to who these people are? And we won't even get into that a lot of them, as we've heard, are the kinds of people who actually vote Republican. Really, he's talking about the old yep. and the poor and the down on their luck. It requires, it, it, it displays such a lack of foresight, such a lack of compassion. And I really think that ultimately he just bumbles into these things because he enjoys standing in a room and saying the things that he thinks are going to get him praised because he wants to be president just because he wants to be king. It's harder and harder for me to see exactly what this man really wants to do. And as of this, I frankly think that this pretty much probably deep sixes his candidacy. That's why I was so confident a few minutes ago. Oh, please. Obama has it. I'm not alone in this. And I'm really disappointed in the man because I wasn't going to vote for him either. But there is, there's a hollow suit there. I can barely think of a recent candidate who really had this little to say, this little core, even if that core was factually wrong sometimes. I just see a, it's a nasty, airheaded, not to mention unwise thing to say in this era of internet. I'm just, um, I'm, this is all, this is worse than his, his, his welfare Obama comments where he was implying that the Obama administration wants to put more people on welfare when factually it's clear that they didn't. This is even worse. I'm, I'm, I'm appalled. Absolutely appalled. Okay, John, uh, we agree to disagree about this one too. Not a serious man. Mitt Romney is not a serious man. No. I mean, no, I don't think so. Even as somebody who is a leading member of a religion which is under threat in such a way that you Not assume... a serious man. He's been governor of Massachusetts. He built a business and made a fortune. He's... Come on, not a serious man. No, no, he would have been a serious not man. Not a serious man. When he was governor of Massachusetts. But look at the way he's disavowed it just so he could become king. I don't see him as somebody with any uh, kind of process. You just drunk the Kool-Aid, John. This is like uh, the Obama campaign narrative. Do you get the memos? Is that it? <laughs> no, <laughs> I, don't, I don't see why you don't agree. I, I don't think that he's a serious man. I do not agree. He's vastly more qualified for the office on the basis of his life experience to date than was the current incumbent when he occupied the office for the first time four years ago. I grant you he's, that. He's done a great deal in his life. I don't know how you can say he's not serious. Now, you may say you're not going to vote for him. I just said I wasn't going to vote for him. You may, I think, correctly uh, observe that he has not articulated any kind of sort of consistent and coherent, uh, uh, you know, passionately expressed, deeply felt, clearly thought, uh, crisply uh, conveyed vision about what he wants to do in the office. Okay? Mm -hmm. So there is a kind of resume filling. I've been the best at everything, and I'm going to make my... I'm going to become president of the United States. That's the highest prize you can get to grasp, uh, grasp that ring, and I'm going to do it element to this. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so 
I will buy that, and that is a deficiency of the candidate. I'm not voting for him. I just got through saying that. I'll say it for the third time. But not a serious man. Come on. No. And this statement doesn't render him unserious, no more so than Barack Hussein Obama's statement during the 2008 campaign rendered him uh, too arrogant, aloof, um, and uh, uh, snobbish and uh, contemptuous of the working class uh, non-minorities of the country uh, to be the chief executive. I, you know, th th that too is a caricature mm -hmm. of foisted for partisan purposes. So I see this about Romney as a caricature, comments taken out of context when he didn't know that he was going to be overheard or whatever, speaking to Confederates months and months ago, released at this critical point in the campaign. Come on, man. I, you know. So anyway, you, 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 to, you I think we have to agree to disagree about that. You realize <laughs> that by serious man, I mean, I mean in, in capital S-M, I mean what we might call a mensch, somebody with certain core principles, somebody with some sort of nucleus. Barack Obama was an underqualified candidate who was a serious man, which you can see from his autobiography. He had principles he's had to break some, but you knew there was, there, there was a there there. I'm not seeing that with Romney. I wouldn't have said this in 1994, but it's appalling to me how transparently he's let all of it go just so he can be king. And I don't think we can say this one is taken out of context. That man really does lack a certain heart because he's talking about people who are really hurting, not to mention that it's just plain stupid. He hasn't even done his homework and he was on the ropes even, even in May. I just don't see him as somebody who we can take seriously as a candidate for high office. Do you see what I mean by serious man there? I see what you mean. I still don't agree with you, John, and I'm prepared to move on, but, you know, okay. Okay, let's do the Middle East. Uh, no, I, I see what you mean. You say he's not a mess. You say he doesn't have a soul. <clears throat> you say that uh, he'll say anything to get elected. You say that who knows what he believes in, okay? Mm -hmm. And I say, I say uh, he has uh, gotten himself the nomination in what is an increasingly conservative party, being a relatively moderate Republican, all things considered, mm -hmm. um, having, as I say, gotten elected uh, and performed adequately as chief executive of a fairly liberal and democratic-leaning state, mm -hmm. and, having, and having then had to, as it were, reinvent himself uh, in order to be able to compete effectively in this very conservative party, mm -hmm. who hasn't done a very good job in this campaign of recalibrating yet again and forcefully projecting kind of, you know, what his governing philosophy would be, and therefore hasn't earned my vote. But still, I'm going to call him a serious man, and you're not. And these conclusions about him lacking a heart, I mean, I don't know what they would be based upon. I mean, uh, you, you, you glided very quickly past the role that he plays within his church. Uh, I take that really seriously, and I think it's quite significant that someone is a leader within their civic community, as well as being a leader in the public affairs and a leader in the in the business world and so on. You know, not a serious man. No, no, no. A man we don't know yet? Yeah, I'll say that much. I have to we add. We, we don't know him. I'm, I'm, but, not in, but, you know. I'm not impressed by him being a leader in his church. He was born to that, and it's very deeply inbred in Mormon culture to take a more active part in religion than many people take in theirs. He didn't He didn't know anything different. You know, good good for him. But in terms of what he, he's doing... He can't the, get credit for actually living a life uh, in service to other people. He, it, it's like the inheritance. It, it doesn't reflect on his character. It just reflects on the community from which he comes. As a Mormon, I'm less impressed. No, they are a okay. very serious religion. Got, to be a Mormon a is much more engulfing than for most people to be a Baptist. So I'm not... But I'm not saying that's a characteristic of the person, whether it comes from his community or not. It's something that he takes with him wherever he goes, right? I mean... <laughs> that that element of him is a mitch, even if the mitchness is derived from having been raised as a Mormon, <laughs> I would say. I actually again, have I, had a column coming out in me for a while that I keep forgetting to write, where I say, what kind of Mormon is this? Because, yeah, he's devoting his life to service, and then he comes out into the public sphere and becomes this... This, this callow huckster, and you're saying he hasn't articulated a vision, but isn't it obvious that he doesn't even have one and has forgotten to even pretend to? I'm just surprised. It's inconsistent to me. Not a serious man. 
All right, you've said it for the fourth time. That doesn't make it any more true, John, okay? We disagree. Let's move on. Okay. <laughs> to our final topic of this lovely conversation, which is um, embassy burning, uh, ambassador assassinating, um, you know, feverish crowds uh, uh, vituperating, if that's a word. <laughs> mm hmm <laughs> Uh, and uh, I'm going to look it up as soon as we get off the air. <laughs> I'm already thinking. I don't think it is, but it should be. Yeah. It should be. And uh, so forth and so on, man. What are we to make of uh, this uh, furious reaction in the Islamic world uh, to a uh, film that insults the Prophet Muhammad and their religion, uh, the anti-American character of it? Uh, does it, in fact, reveal that um, your president's my president, too, but... Um, your president's policies with respect to resetting American relations with the Arab world were born in naivete and failed to take the full measure of the alienation uh, from the American, um, American uh, political and national enterprise of this vast swath of humanity. Uh, what are your thoughts there? I'm, I'm just curious. Well, uh, I don't. I think what we're seeing is something that's just going to keep happening again and again until we have a profound recalibration of conditions in that world in terms of geopolitics, in terms of opportunities available particularly to young men, because these are people who feel that they have a right not to have the Prophet Muhammad insulted. It's an interesting characteristic, characterization of rights. Their sense is that that is completely off the table, that there would be any question that they would allow that sort of thing to happen. And our notion of free speech and a government allowing this sort of thing to be, say, on the internet, that doesn't work for them, and I don't think that there's any conversation to be had. They have a sense of honor being primary that for us is, is, is alien. And we can't stop idiots from making videos and from drawing cartoons, and people are not going to stop doing that. And I think that the people in question are going to continue to see these things as profound and intolerable abuses. And the idea of don't they understand the First Amendment fails. What I was thinking about this just a few days ago, Stanley Fish says better than me in the New York Times today. So I think we're just... We're stuck at this point, and maybe a lot of the people who are so upset about these things would have less time to vituperate, and I just looked it up, and that is a word, so Excellent. that's two today. They would have less time to vituperate and maybe could let certain things roll off of them if they had more to think about in their lives. That's my guess, that a certain basic alienation is part of what we might see as an overreaction to insult. But I don't think anything can be fixed on this one. We're stuck with very different ways of looking at the world and what it is to be a person. What about you? I, th I think that last sentence of yours, we're stuck with very different ways of looking at the world and what it means to be a person, is spot on. Uh, it's the implications of the fact that we are in this condition, that is, we hu human beings are in this condition of inhabiting a global uh, complex of civilizations across the divisions of which certain ideas do not travel. It's the implications of that that I'm that I'm not entirely clear on. Mm -hmm. I mean, I I have been uh, very interested in this uh, controversy because um, you know, and it, it echoes the Salman Rushdie you know satanic verses when he publishes the novel and a fatwa is issued on him and he has to go into hiding mm -hmm. for years for years, and the uh, reaction to those cartoons published in a Danish newspaper that depicted the prophet. Mohammed, and it, it, it reminds me of the debate back during the culture wars of the 1980s about the National Endowment for the Arts. You know, they gave a small grant that supported the work of a man called Robert Maplethorpe, mm -hmm. um, a man who was gay. Homoerotic, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, he totally. made homoerotic art, amongst other things. One of his works had a crucifix sitting in a beaker of yellow liquid. It's called uh, Piss it was Christ. Called right. Piss Christ. And he had put the crucifix in something he invited us to see as urine, you know, mm -hmm. this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the debate was not that, the debate within the United States about that, was not that um, uh, he shouldn't be able to do it. It was that public money shouldn't be going to support him doing it. Mm -hmm. um, and it's very clear that, I'm talking about Maplethorpe now, that work of art was a work of art. Okay, and, and that act of speech, that is the image that he projected, 
was a piece of social criticism that uh, it would have been horrific to imagine could not be expressed within our society. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, uh, you can criticize religion, and it's a good thing too. Okay, and we've worked this out within uh, liberalism in the West uh, to a pretty high degree. I mean, if you go and pick up John Stuart Mill's uh, essay written in I think 1860 or 1861 on liberty, mm -hmm. and you read there his defense of an atheist uh, right. Uh, to be able to voice their non-belief publicly, mm -hmm. even in a society in which the vast majority of people are offended by that statement and believe. Mm -hmm. I mean, you sort of see the core of this idea. This is a profoundly important development. The idea that it's a benefit to be able to debate it, even if almost everybody considers it wrong. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. Exactly. That's the idea. The idea that the, even, even the truth, the vitality of the truth is enhanced by refuting the heretic. Mm -hmm. You want to allow the heretic to speak even if he's speaking falsehoods, because the act of refuting him strengthens and uh, enriches uh, your own belief. And, you know, so, so this is an advance, this kind of idea, and the instantiation of institutions, the creation of institutions that embody this idea and protect this idea. Oh, you feel it's an advance? I, I feel the... Because that's the, a loaded uh, statement. The advent... Of, an, of a philosophically robust understanding that get, then gets enshrined in law, in law and civic practice of the idea that people ought be free mm -hmm. to express themselves even when they say the most unpopular things. Not shouting, not the incitement, not shouting fire in a crowded theater, that kind of thing. And this, well, could have been ultimately an act of incitement, the controversy that we're talking about with this anti-Islamic film. But uh, this idea that free speech is a, is a, a prized value at the center of our uh, 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 collective life, I think that's an advancement. Yes, I do. Well, um, I don't, I'm not comfortable saying that anymore because so very yeah. many people don't agree with this. And if we call it, I'm being coy, but if we call it an advancement, then we're calling these Muslim societies backwards, right? We've to gotten further extent, than them. To the extent that their anti-blasphemy laws persecute people for expressing criticisms of the religion that the majority uh, embraces, mm -hmm. I regard that as an aspect of political backwardness, not dissimilar from to the extent that their laws inhibit the equal participation in public life of people who happen to be women mm -hmm. constitutes a backward element to, that we, uh, within the Western um, sphere, have ourselves, in relatively recent history, uh, progressed toward overcoming. So it's not about yes. diversity. It's that we have had an insight, especially since the 1600s, that they have not been privy to, and they might benefit from doing things more our way. I don't like the we and the our, although I know I've invited that with my own formulation. I, I wouldn't try to make the separation so stark. I don't think there's anything essentialist about it. You know, there's something in the drinking water of the West that makes us superior and so forth. But yes, I think that the evolution of political understanding and political philosophic commitment, the idea that slavery is wrong, the idea that women are to be uh, equal citizens, uh, the idea that uh, that uh, the people are the ultimate source of sovereignty, mm -hmm. uh, the idea the idea that political speech should be protected in the interest of the maintenance of a uh, open and a free um, uh, uh, you know a context for uh, communication between people as they try to govern themselves, um, the idea that there should be a robust and independent press that has the capacity to criticize the actions of uh, powerful people uh, without fear of uh, of being uh, murdered or uh, uh, you know dispossessed or whatever it might be. All of these are are uh, 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 road signs of progress along the way uh, for uh, uh, Western uh, uh, political institutions. So does that and mean? The, so does that yeah, mean and, that if Rush Limbaugh calls Sandra Fluke a slut? that he should be allowed to keep doing what he does and that there should be no calls for his being fired? Because this is what this plays into, free well, speech. Well, no, 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 no. I mean, I think that's a confusion with respect. I mean, I think 
It's the action of the state that we're talking about here. Okay. If people, if people boycott Chick-fil-A because they don't like what the chief executive officer said, if people turn their radio dials away and adv advertisers decide that they no longer want to support a particular talk show host mm -hmm. because he's offensive or crude or ignorant, or mm -hmm. whatever it might be. Of course they have the right to do that. I don't have to invite you to my dinner party if I think that you're, you know, an asshole. Mm -hmm. And if you say things that cause me to think that you're an asshole, I'm not going to invite you to my dinner party. That's not an infringement upon your free speech. Right. That is simply that is simply the social consequences of people hearing you speak in a particular way. And it's true that that kind of anticipated uh, sanction might induce some people not to say what they think. That's mm -hmm. called political correctness, in, in my view. People don't always say what they think because they know it will be unpopular and they don't want to be seen to be unpopular. No, mm -hmm. no, no, no. What I'm talking about <coughs> is the action of the state and the fact that the person has a legal right protected by the institutions of the state uh, to express themselves openly even when they uh, voice unpopular opinion. And that the role of the state is not to get into, you know, the content of that opinion, it's right or it's wrong, we agree or we disagree, but to continue to protect and, you know, sustain an institutional environment in which the expression of that opinion can take place in an unfettered manner. And I think we have achieved that to a very high degree in the West, and I think that's uh, a tribute to the, the quality of this, uh, of this political dispensation that we enjoy in the West. I, I agree with you, but there's a part of me that worries that we're talking about legions and legions of people. Oh, folks, in terms of blogging heads pets, what you are seeing right now is Clancy, the cat, and I'm getting rid of him. Glenn, my cat's on my lap, sorry. That's all right, um, John. I don't mind. So I, don't, that, I don't have anything <laughs> comparable over here. That's, that's Clancy, right. folks. Anyway, um, the um, I agree, but there's so very many people, and many of them are professors and deep thinkers who just can't handle th that aspect of things. And I think here in the United States, we have a lot of trouble with it, too, when it touches on what we consider a lot of our sacred cows, the sense that, well, you just can't say that, that words matter, that words hurt. We, we almost start to question our ideals. And there are people here who were told, haven't you heard of the First Amendment, in a general sense that, well, there must be certain places where the First Amendment can't apply because I'm just hurting so badly. And so I, I get it, but it also just seems to me that... um. They're not going to change their mind, and we have an Internet. And so things are going to keep on being said, because there's a certain kind of person who's a, pro a professional provocateur. And so do you see any possibility of a dialogue? Because certainly it isn't that we tell the people on the streets now in those countries, you have to understand that we do things differently from you. Because their response is, well, you shouldn't. And it just stops there. The, the answer is yes, I see a chance. I mean, not in a heated moment like this. Okay, but over the longer term, I do see a chance for a dialogue. I think there are many forces of moderation within Islamic civilization broadly understood. I mm -hmm. think Indonesia is, a, is very different, and Indonesia or Malaysia are very different than Saudi Arabia. Okay? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, I think that um, as the history of the West reveals, uh, dealing with the challenge of modernity uh, is is difficult and it takes a very long time. Uh, I think that the Islamic societies are behind us in a certain sense that could be made rigorous uh, in dealing with the implications of uh, the modern world, uh, which has shrunk, uh, which is uh, pluralistic, uh, in which half of humanity, that is the female half, are going to be heard from, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and all the rest. Uh, I think they're behind us, but I don't see any reason to conclude that Again, broadly speaking, they can't get there. Um, and uh, it'll be a know, while. I, pardon? It'll be a while, but yeah. Uh, I had the uh, wonderful experience some years ago of participating in a dialogue with some Islamic scholars that was organized by um, um, uh, this guy at the Institute for American Values in New York City, uh, uh, David. Um, I may think of his name soon. I'm sorry, I can't think of his name. Anyway, he's a maybe mildly right-of-center culture entrepreneur type guy who created this institute in New York that has uh, had a certain uh, success in a, in a relatively small scale. And he organized an Islam West conversation after uh, the um, uh, outbreak of the Iraq War back in 2003. 
uh, and brought some people from North Africa and in the Middle East and whatnot together with some people like myself from North America, a few people from Europe, and we sat around a table for a few days uh, on the island of Malta and bandied about, do we have anything to talk about? Uh, and this included journalists from, you know, Syria and, and relatively liberal uh, Muslim scholars from, uh, you know, uh, Tunisia and Morocco, and uh, there was someone from Oman and places like that. Mm -hmm. And, and um, I was impressed with the extent to which uh, the people that I met there were uh, deeply read in the literature of political theory and political philosophy of the West and were deeply committed to struggling toward the creation of open societies in the countries where they live. Now, they didn't agree, you know, with the American sensibility about a whole lot of stuff, okay, especially about um, uh, Israel and uh, our role in that conflict in Palestine. Uh, but but uh, on the whole, I came away thinking that these were people that I could, uh, could communicate with and could talk to, and that mm -hmm. uh, there was a lot of common ground. Now, they were a minority. They are a minority within the societies, and they have an a, a, you know, uphill struggle, and it may be three steps back for every step forward for a while, uh, but it's not like there's no there there. That was my, well, that was my sense. I hope, I hope that's correct. Glenn, I think we have to yeah, close I think down we have to go to. for mm -hmm. today. Great, John. Thanks again. This